<laughs> okay, and so said we uh, we will go through some of these solutions as a means of uh, providing topics. So please do uh, give me any questions or queries that you might have while we're going through these, or any of the uh, related related uh, queries to any of these questions as we go through. So we did uh, we did just briefly at the end of yesterday's lecture we did uh, that last part part D of question one. So I'll just go through the other the other parts first. Remember this exam there's there's eight questions in total. You have to do five, but you must do questions one and two in section A, that can both three, questions one and two, and then you select any three questions from the six that are available in section uh, section B, question three, question three through to eight, making any, uh, any two of those. Any three of those. You can answer more than five questions if you wish, and you will get the marks from your best five questions, subject to the fact they must include uh, questions one and two. Okay, so if we look at question 1A, this is a pretty question from one of the very earliest things we looked at, which is uh, sequences. So you we're talking about a sequence of elements Xn there, defined by this relation. So you're given an explicit formula for the elements Xn, it's in terms of factorials, and you're asked to prove that this sequence is decreasing and I must have been feeling fairly generous back then, 2014. Uh, I actually gave quite a quite a substantial hint there. So I told told the candidate to examine the ratio x n plus one over x n, compare it to compare it to one in order to draw your conclusions. So following the guidance there. We will look at xn plus 1 over xn. We're not talking about any limit here. We're not talking about the limiting behavior of this sequence or anything. Just looking at its general behavior. So, you know, the kind of things you need to know here is you need to be able to manipulate uh, the notation and the definition and understand well the definition of factorials. So xn plus 1 is n plus 1 factorial over 2 times n plus 1 factorial. And then divided by xn, when you've got xn exactly there, you're going to divide by xn, so that's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal, 1 over xn, which is a factorial of 2n divided by n factorial. And these are all, you know, nearby factorials or neighboring factorials of one another. So you're going to get a lot of cancellation, especially after you just expand out this bracket in the bottom of it and see that this is the factorial of 2n plus 2. So remembering the basic idea that x factorial is x times x minus 1 times all the way down to 3 by 2, multiplying together all the factors from x down to 1, at least when x is an integer, that makes sense. Then you can see that, for instance, n plus 1 factorial divided by n factorial, well, n plus 1 factorial and n factorial are essentially the same except n plus 1 factorial has an extra factor of n plus 1 at the beginning, if you like. But apart from that, every other factor in n plus 1 factorial is also down here, so they're all going to cancel and just leave you with the quantity n plus 1 up here. And the factorials of 2n are quite similar as well, but this one on the bottom just has two extra factors compared to this factorial, uh, factorial of 2n in the top. So if you're left with 2n plus 2, multiplied by 2n plus, plus 1 in the denominator. But 
we might do then is multiply at the bottom. So you can see this is 4n squared uh, plus 2 plus 2 plus 6n plus, uh, plus 2. And you know, if you really wanted to, to did I do that right? Four and square plus. If you really wanted to be explicit about it, you could write the denominator as the bit from the numerator plus the extra stuff, so plus four n squared plus five n plus one. And that makes it as clear as day that remember what what are typical values of n here. When we're talking about the sequence xn, where n goes from 1 to infinity, so n is always an integer bigger than or equal to 1. But then it's very clear that this quantity you're looking at is something, n plus 1, divided by itself, well, divided by a number that is equal to itself, plus quite a large extra contribution. Okay? So the denominator is always going to be strictly bigger than, than the numerator. So this quantity is certainly always strictly less than strictly less than one. Make sure you got it going in the right direction. Yeah, because the numerator is smaller smaller than the denominator. And um, so. In total, we've shown that xn plus 1 over xn is strictly less than 1, so that implies that xn plus 1 is strictly less, less than xn for every n bigger than 1, so i.e. the sequences decrease. We can't do anything. <clears throat> so, a nice and approachable question for the first one. Any, uh, any queries on that? Or okay, so we could go on to part B. In that case, so part B presents us with a function g from z to z for the integers to the integers, and this is defined by defined by g of an integer z is two z squared. Z squared minus one. And the question you're asked about this is, is this function injective? Is it, is it surjective? I'm not just giving a yes or no, but actually demonstrate your understanding of these terms. So explain your, your answers with references to elements from the domain and the co-domain of G. So I would pretty much as, as Part of answering this, I would give the definition of both both um, both both concepts. So G is injective if and only if you basically just give the give, give, give the definition of it. If and only if uh, for all pairs of integers z1 and z2 that if they take the same value, that must imply that Z1 is actually equal to Z2. So this is saying that you can never have, in other words, you draw a kind of a Venn diagram to indicate the action of G, you can never have two distinct elements here getting sent to the same element by, by G. That is not one to one. This is not injected illustrated in this little sketch. So, because this is too, well, as suggested by the sketch, this is too 
different elements getting mapped to the same element by G. So G is going to be injective if and only if this is true. That's the definition of injective. So is G going to behave like that? Well, no, it's not. Because you can see it's part of one of the operations involved in the definition of G. Squaring. Squaring is certainly not a, a injective operation if you've got positive and negative arguments in your domain. Okay? Because squaring produces the same value when you square a positive and negative quantity of the same absolute value. So we can show that this is not injective by producing a counter time. Consider g of minus 1 with a g plus 1. g of minus 1 is 2 times the square of minus 1 minus 1, which is what? 1, which is equal to 2 times the square of 1 minus 1, which is equal to g of 1. But 1 is not the same, certainly, as minus 1. So that proves that it's not in the Just that one example, that one instance of two to one behavior proves that it's not injective because the definition of injective says for all pairs S1 and S2, this property has to have. Well, here's a pair of relatives. So G is not injective. So that would get you the marks for the objective part. For the surjective part, I would do the same thing. I would, I would give the definition of surjective and then a clear explanation of whether or not this one is. Okay. So G is surjective. G is surjective if and only if. Uh, if only if, so what's the condition here? Here you have to say for every, uh, I won't use a Z, I'll use a Y. So for every Y in Z, there exists Z in Z such that G of Z equals the Y. Okay, this is the definition of the surjective. So in the Venn diagram in terms, the mapping diagram in terms, if you've got all the elements in the codomain, every element in the codomain must have an arrow coming into it. Okay? Every element in the codomain has something getting mapped into it. Then the function is sir. Sir, like that French preposition is gone. So Sort of tab on the table, whatever. Another place that word sir is used. Um, so, is this surjective or not? Can you produce? Can you produce every value y, every integer y, as a value of our function g, or are some values inaccessible to to g? So a few people shaking their head. So that's a big no. So when, when you look at the formula for G, so it's correct to shake your head. 2z squared minus 1. You see this part 2z squared, because it's squaring, this first bit 2z squared will always be non-negative. It'll always be greater than or equal to zero. So you've got something which is always greater than or equal to zero minus one. So that means there's a lower bound on how low this thing can go. The lowest this can go to is um, the lowest this can go to is uh, minus one. When you have z equal zero, you can get the value minus one. But every other value you get out of g is going to be higher. So it's going to be minus one plus it. Also, another reason you could use is these values are always odd, aren't they? Because this bit 2z squared is always even, it's clearly divisible by 2, the 2z squared, and then you're subtracting 1. So actually, g only ever takes on odd values. So you could also argue that it never produces even values. So either, either way, 
you can see that G is not uh, surjective. So you could say, well, G of Z is 2Z squared minus 1. This is always greater than or equal to minus 1 since Z squared is always greater than or equal to 0. So for all Z, G of Z can never be equal to minus 2. Alternatively, for all Z, G of Z will never be equal to 2, as 2Z squared minus 1 is always, always odd. Even number, even number minus one. So it's clearly always not. So you could never get two as a value. So it's certainly not two there. Okay. All the values less than minus one don't occur as values of function g. And moreover, no even numbers occur as values of values of g. So g is very far from being surjective. When you're doing this, you know, do 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 use these answers to show what you know to demonstrate your understanding. So this is a nice complete answer to that question. We provided the precise definitions of the terms, and uh, and then given very clear counterexamples in the context of this uh, this particular function. Is that okay? Any uh, queries about that, sir? So you should know the definitions of injective and surjective. Don't get too confused. Um, know as well that they're separate properties. They're independent properties in the sense that just because a function is injective doesn't mean it has to be surjective or vice versa. So you can find, you know, for those two properties, you can easily write down definitions of functions, which are, you know, which can show any of the four combinations of the properties, injective and surjective, neither or one or one and not the other. Okay, so they're independent properties. Okay. Question C is uh, about part C is about uh, finding derivatives. Given a function of x there, which is a little bit complicated, it's a product of two, well, product and a composition of kind of basic building block functions, and you ask to find the first and second derivatives. So So here you're going to be demonstrating that you can find derivatives by making use of derivatives of standard functions together with the properties of the derivatives, such as linearity, product rule, the chain rule, the quotient rule, things like that. So uh, to find Find the first derivative df dx. We need to use the product rule. This is certainly seen to be a product of two functions. This f is equal to u times b and also the chain rule for b because b is cosine of 3x squared plus 2 which is equal to cosine of 
w of x, for w of x is that polynomial that 3x squared plus 2. So you just kind of indicate, you know, the need for using these rules, uh, and then you can then go ahead, you, know, you can then go ahead and kind of apply them correctly. So try and get across the reader that you know you see why the rules are needed and in what sense they're needed. Okay, so this is the product of the two functions u and v, and v itself can be seen as a composition of cosine and that polynomial type function. W. So let's actually work it out. Df dx. So doing the product bit, we would um, so let's differentiate the u part, which will be two e to the two x, and then that multiplies by the v function left unchanged. So du dx times v of x, and then you add on the function u. When change multiplied by the derivative of the cosine of, of the v function. This is where you have to use the chain rule. The derivative of the cosine is uh, minus sine. It's not the same argument. But then you're applying the chain rule, and this cosine is composed with this polynomial function inside the bracket. So you then have to multiply that by the derivative of the inner function, the derivative of that polynomial bit, which is uh, 6x. Is that v before uh, cosine? In derivative? Uh, last, no, no, yes. It, yes, is that v before cosine? No. D? Sorry, that's, sorry, yeah, it's just my handwriting. Script D, yeah. It's nothing, it's just the, not the tail, it's the head. Leave it into the city. Yeah. Okay. Right. Just like up here. Uh, okay. Good, good. So that's what it is. So maybe just simplify that a little bit. There's a factor of e to the 2x in both of them. In fact, it's a factor of 2e to the 2x in both of them. You can take that out. It's a cosine of 3x squared plus 2. And that leaves behind 3x there, minus 3x sine 3x squared. Okay, so the first derivative. Okay, and I asked you to get the second derivative, which is a little bit intimidating just because you've got to use more and more of these rules, so the expression might get a little long. So, to find the second derivative, d squared f dx squared, we find, well, the definition of that is d dx of df dx, the, the, the first derivative of the first derivative, and apply, apply the same rules, product of chain. Uh, as appropriate questions. You know, already in, in the first part, I, I pointed out explicitly where the product rule was needed, where the chain rule was needed. And you don't have to labor that point again here. I've already demonstrated that. As long as I do it correctly here. Yeah, okay. The d2 f dx squared. So again, this is a product. So let's, uh, what did we do before? We, we differentiated the first one first. So that's four e to the two x multiplied by that whole bracket left unchanged. So sine three x squared plus two minus three x sine three x squared plus two. And then the second part of the product rule would be to hold it two e 2x the same, then multiply that by what you find inside. So the cosine x will differentiate to minus sine 3x squared plus 2, again multiplied by 6x, operating the chain rule. Then you, have, 
Okay. Okay, so then we are continuing on. We've got to multiply by the derivative of this. But this this itself is requires the product of the product of the function x times the sine function. Okay, so you just gotta, uh, you know, take count and carry it out. Okay, product rule, product rule. So it's gonna be minus 3 times the sine of 3x squared plus 2. Uh, that was differentiating the 3x bit. Then we leave the minus 3x bit alone. And then differentiate the sine bit, which goes to cosine three x squared plus two, and then multiply by your six x. Okay. So maybe bits of factorization you might do there. Certainly. Yeah. I mean. I you probably have accumulated all the marks by here. You've done the differentiation correctly. But you might, um, yeah, everything is a factor of e to the 2x on it. You could factorize out e to the 2x out of everything. Then let's just look at the cosines. You've got 4 times cosine. Then back here, you've got a 2 times the cosine. So you could say this is cosine 3x squared plus 2 multiplied into the 4 to give you that bit. That 18x squared minus 18x squared plus another 2 minus 36x squared. That deals with the cosine x squared and that bit, and you've just got all these sine x sine of 3x squared plus 2s. What are they multiplying? Well, up here, you've got 4, you've got minus 12x. Minus 12x, and then here you've got minus. 12x again. This minus 24x. That deals with those and those. And you just got minus 6. Okay, I think I factorized that correctly, but I maybe want to double, triple check the bit. But to be honest, if you just stop there, probably would have gotten all the marks by then because carried out all the differentiation correctly. Uh, okay, the uh, queries on that one are. So one D I did yesterday, so I'll refer you to that if you weren't here. It's on the YouTube as normal. So we might jump forward to question three then. Question two is from Saeed Tab. Question three, this is the first of these optional questions. Okay, let's have a look at question three. This is on series.
first question says to uh, consider this series, the sum of AM, AM given by that formula, use an appropriate convergence test to determine whether the series is convergent or not. Then B, given that series there, a bit of instruction, determine the value of this sum by making use of the telescoping nature of its partial sums. In your answer, explain clearly how this aspect of the partial sums allows you to determine the sum. Do pay close attention to any of the guidance given in the questions. You know, but then if it's asking for certain detail or certain explanations of certain things, do make sure you provide them, okay? They're there for a reason. Okay, so this question 3A, I believe, requires the ratio test. So for some of the series AM, where AM is defined as N over N minus 1 factorial. These kind of general questions which say, look at this series, is it divergent or convergent? Remember, we have that whole family of convergence tests. <coughs> That were available to use on problems like this. Things like comparison tests, ratio tests, geometric series tests, the integral test, the root test. So it's a collection of different tools, and for certain series, certain tools might work in the sense that they might produce an act, they might produce a decision. But you pick the wrong tool or the inappropriate test and try it on a series, it probably won't give you a conclusion either way because you won't be able to operate the test or prove the necessary conditions on the test. And there were some rules of thumb to guide you uh, on which test to apply in which situation. And this, since we see the presence of the factorial being used here again, We've seen it, we've seen that in question one, when you can put ratios of neighboring factorials over each other, you get a lot of cancellation. You just have to put one or two factors. The same thing is going to happen here, because there's a one of the convergence tests which is able to be used here is called the ratio test, where you examine the limit of the ratio of consecutive terms in the series. And so taking a ratio of consecutive terms there will involve having neighboring factorials in the fraction from below the line. So you'll, so you'll again get a lot of cancellation. So the thing will simplify quite a lot, and you should hopefully be able to determine what the limit of the So that we we will apply the ratio test here. And you will have in the extra handout, you will have the statement, the precise statements of all these convergence tests. So you don't have to be concerned about remembering the specification of them all by heart. We will need to be uh, familiar with all of them and experienced in using, in using them. So to do this, we examine the limit. <coughs> <laughs> okay, so we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity of the ratio of consecutive terms, an plus 1 over an. This is important which one you put over the other one, because the conclusion of this is based on, the conclusion of this is based on judging whether or not the limit is bigger or smaller than 1. So if you get the ratio flipped, looking at the other way, okay, you can still operate the test, but the decision on whether the limit is bigger or less than one will have to be reversed if you're flipping the thing. Because if it's smaller than one and you flip it, it's going to be bigger than one. So. But this is the way we quote it, uh, the way we say it. So we examine this limit, am plus one. Going to be n plus 1 over n factorial <coughs> divided by a n, going to be multiplying by the reciprocal of that, which is going to be that uh, there. So, what's happening here? 
that n plus one over m, and the factorials will cancel to leave everything will go from this factorial in the top, and you'll just be left with a factor of m behind in the, in the denominator. So it'll be the limit of n plus one over n squared. So that's just comes from canceling the factorials. Um, and to decide on that limit, to explain precisely how, how that limit is determined, yeah, we could divide above and below by the highest power of n that we see. And this would be 1 over m plus 1 over m squared all over 1. So in other words, it's just a limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over m plus 1 over m squared. And it's pretty obvious that each of those individual terms, as n goes to infinity, each of those individual two terms are converted to zero. It's one over n, one over n squared. As n goes to infinity, so do both of those denominators, n and n squared. So by the linearity of the limiting process, the, that linear part of the algebra of limits theorem, this, this is going to be equal to zero. I would just justify that there by the algebra of limits theorem. And the fact that 1 over n and 1 over n squared both converge to 0 then those, those two. So you go to some effort to demonstrate your understanding. Don't leave the reader in any doubt that you know how all the different bits fit together and so on. Okay, so where are we? We're, we're operating the ratio test. You work out this limit, and you find that it is zero. So since this limit, since this limit L, so we'll call this thing L, satisfies, uh, what was it, the absolute value of L had to be strictly less than one. The series sum of am equals 1 to infinity is convergent. Okay. So do practice, you know, do look back in the uh, tutorial sheets that we had in the first term. Do practice again all those questions about convergence of series and so on. If you look in the, the online ebook, the Shen's outline, the calculus book, in the relevant chapter there, you'll find lots of examples of the application of these various uh, series convergence tests as well. Part B is some more on infinite series. There's a fair bit of guidance there. Um, yeah. So we have to determine what this limit is, what the series is, 2 over m squared plus 3m. Well, and you can approach this in various ways. The, the point of it is, is that we see that we have this nice factorization in the denominator. This is a rational function we're looking at, this ratio of polynomials in M. And we know that there do exist nice expressions for those, which are the uh, partial fraction expansions. So I should be able to 
I should be able to take a single fraction and rewrite it as something over n plus or minus something over n plus 3. And, okay, there's, there's a kind of bit of an involved procedure to go through to find them in general, but because this is a fairly minimal example, you could more or less get it just in your head, so to speak. Whatever numerators you put there, you have to imagine collapsing these two fractions again together under the rules for adding fractions. And because there's no ends in the numerator, that means whatever numerators you have here, they have to be plus and minus of one another. So that this n gets multiplied by whatever this is, and this n plus 3 gets multiplied by whatever that is. You add those two products together to get you the numerator. But because the ends disappear, this and this have to be plus and minus of each other. But in order to end up with a 2, you must be multiplying this one by 2 thirds. Because 2 thirds of 3 gives you a 2. So that tells you that that has to be 2 thirds, and this one has to be minus 2 thirds. So let's, you know, let's just say expansion found by inspection there. Just find something by just kind of quickly sorting it through in your mind. You can say, well, you did it by inspection. If you're struggling to see that, or you know, in, in, in whatever example you face, you just can't do that, then you would need a side calculation following the method where you assign unnamed you know, new variable names to those numerators and combine the thing, follow through, get the system equation, and solve the system. Okay, let's see if we can wrap this up in the few minutes available. Okay, so how does this help us? Well, this helps us once we, yeah, see at the moment we got an infinite sum here. We do have to be careful about separating infinite sum. In, infinite sums in some ways behave, you, know, you can't automatically do exactly the same things to them that you do with finite sums, but you can, introduce the finite sum here when you introduce the definition of what an infinite series actually means. We define what an infinite series actually means was the limit of the sequence of partial sums. So now I'm looking at the limit of the sequence K is the index of the sequence. You see the K appearing up here. It's the upper limit of the, of the partial sum. So this, this is what we call the cake partial sum. Take the partial sum of the series. Now this partial sum you can do the normal things that you do to partial sum, do to sums. That factor of two thirds we can bring out to the front because that's kind of needlessly obfuscating some there or complicating it. So it's now one over n minus one over n plus three. Just makes it a bit easier to look at and see what's going on. And so the instruction in the question said to look at the telescoping nature of the partial sum. That telescoping was the descriptive word we gave to the, the lots and lots of cancellation that we see going on in these partial sums. If you think about it, every time, every time this sum that, that you have a one of these negative fractions, minus one over n plus three, that's going to get cancelled out by its positive partner, one over n three steps later. Three steps after this minus one over n plus three occurred, you'll get a plus one over n after n had grown by three units. And that will cancel off that negative point. So these negative these negative fractions get cancelled by the positive ones that occur three steps afterwards. Or to put it another way, the positive fractions get cancelled by the negative ones that occurred three steps before they occur. 
So that means everything cancels except for the bits at the front, which don't have earlier partners, and the bits at the end, which don't have later partners. So the bits at the front, which don't have any earlier partners, are 1 over 1, and then equals 1, 1 over 2, and 1 over 3. There was no negative counterpart that came earlier in the series to cancel off those. 1 over 4 does not survive because the positive fraction 1 over 4, well, you see, in the very first term, n equals 1, there was a negative 1 over 4. So that negative 1 over 4 cancels with the positive 1 over 4 that occurs in the fourth row. This remain, and some negative bits remain at the end, namely n plus 1, minus 1 over n plus 2, and minus 1 over n plus 3. Two brackets there. Okay, thank you. Yes, those ones appearing at the end are K's. Those are the, 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 the K is the top limit of the sum. So these are the last three negative fractions that occur the last three terms of the sum, because they don't have any following positive bits to cancel off of them, because they're right at the end, there are no more positive bits. For them. So just put in a little comment here to say all other, all other positive and negative fractions are cancelled. Are cancelled. So this is greatly simplified. There's no longer any big, you know, general sum of uncertain length. It's now just six things added together. And you're taking the limit. Three of them are just constants, so they're not going to change. You got two thirds, and this is three. This is a six. Six plus three plus two. Eleven six. These still are with your k's. I'm using the algebra limits theorem. This is just converges to two thirds of eleven six, whatever that is. Since one over k plus i tends to zero, as k goes to infinity, for i equals one two three. I'm using so I have those three correctly six plus three plus two. And two thirds of eleven six is whatever it is. Uh, eleven over three? No. Eleven over eleven over nine. So we were able to see we did that quite nicely just in one giant equation from the beginning to the end. So we started off in a series, step by step. Crucially, this step here, this step here is by the definition of an infinite sum. The definition of the infinite sum is the limit of the partials. That was quite crucial. I would make sure to include that in justification. Then that made it finite sums, so we could just do the usual algebraic manipulations of finite sums. So we saw the thing as a limit as quite a, a nice application of the algebra limits theorem. There's a constant, just plus a load of things that are converging to zero. Therefore, the thing just converges to that. Okay, you can see various uh, things to justify there, various points to you know demonstrate your understanding, understand how it all fits together. So on. Okay, that's good. That got us dealt with questions one and three. We'll do with other parts, uh, and I'll see you again next week. And uh, your tutorials next week should focus on some revision uh, activities as well.
look at, I will be uploading at some stage next week the some uh, work solutions to the last uh, couple of exam papers. 2016, 2015. Did I hand out the register? I did.